Hello Fosdem and welcome to my talk, Slow Things Down to Make Them Go Faster. My name is Jimmy, I'm a senior Postgres architect at EDB, and in this talk we'll be looking at how you can overwhelm your Postgres system with simply workload and what you can do to try to avoid that. So specifically, um, we will be looking at high concurrency in Postgres, we will be looking at how Postgres does ACID and what MVCC means. Um, we'll be examining locks and then we'll be looking at high transaction rates and how they affect your Postgres system. Finally, we will be discussing strategies that you can use to mitigate all of the problems that can be caused by large uh, workloads on Postgres. So. Uh, first off, let's look at high concurrency and Postgres and what that means. So high concurrency is, in a relational database context, it's the ability to have transactions execute concurrently, not serially. So that means you have multiple connections or users trying to do different things on the database and you want these to happen more or less at the same time rather than wait for one another. Of course, you can understand how that can lead to problems if users of the database are trying to access the same data. So practically speaking, what you want to do when you have a database system is you want to serve multiple users or multiple user sessions more or less simultaneously. So how do you avoid conflicts between those uh, sessions and some famous conflicts that can arise when you uh, have user concurrency are dirty reads, lost updates, etc. Uh, you can look them up in any database theory book. So the way you avoid problems like these when you have multiple users acc accessing the same data set is concurrency control. And concurrency control is built into Postgres and we'll see how it works uh, later on in this presentation. So Postgres, you need to know, is designed from the beginning to be able to provide high concurrency in a safe manner for user data. So Postgres from the beginning was designed to be able to serve uh, many user activities at the same time and even hundreds at the same time. So let's look at how Postgres works. Uh, Postgres is a multi-process system, right? It's a client-server implementation with a hard separation between the client and the server, which is intentional. So on the server side, what happens is you have multiple processes and basically you have one process per user. So this model means that each user that is trying to do something gets a backend or a backend process of their own and that executes their queries. So every client process connects exactly to one backend process on the server side. Those processes are coordinated by what is called the Postmaster uh, or the uh, Postgres server process that supervises all of these um, uh, backends. And of course, because we're talking about a single database system, there needs to be inter-process communication. So processes need to be able to exchange data and coordinate among them. So the way Postgres does IPC or inter-process communication is through semaphores and more importantly, shared memory. So you have shared memory when two processes are trying to access the same thing, they will find it in shared memory. Finally, with a multi-process system such as Postgres, there is always the risk of creating way too many processes for the system to be able to deal with. And in that case, you will have uh, excessive CPU context switching uh, because the overhead of accounting for all of these processes and coordinating them is just too much for the system. 
But before we get to that point, let's look at uh, how Postgres implements ACID and uh, what MVCC is and how it works. So ACID in a database context is atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. So we're going to focus for this talk on the I of ACID. So isolation. Let's look at what isolation is. So isolation in, in this database context is how transaction integrity is visible by other sessions. So it's leave me alone. I want to do my own work and I don't want to be disturbed by your processes, right? But also I want the security of my data reading or writing operations to not be affected by what other users are doing on the system. So transaction integrity and how that relates to other sessions that are executing things on the server side at the same time as I am. We briefly spoke about anomalies and these anomalies that you can have uh, when, with concurrent access of data are dirty reads, non-repeatable reads, phantom reads, lost updates, and write or read-only transaction skew. So uh, specifically, dirty reads are when you read something that uh, another process hasn't actually committed yet. It's like reading a work in progress. Non-repeatable reads are when you try to access something and the next time you access it you know, with your next query, uh, the context has changed or the data has changed. Phantom reads are, again, when you're trying to read something uh, from uh, another that another process has changed. Uh, lost updates are when you write something to disk and another process overwrites your change. Uh, write transaction skew uh, is when two competing processes have tried to change the same data and there's a partial change. So one of them manages to change some of the fields and another one affects the rest of the field. So you're left with an inconsistency and read-only transaction skew is when you believe that uh, a read-only transaction is safe, but because of the series of operations and the actions of two other processes, uh, it ends up being unsafe because you have checked, let's say, the value at the wrong point in time. So how do you avoid all of these horror stories with your data? Um, we have what are called isolation levels. So the lower the isolation level, the more sessions that can access the same data. But this comes with a risk, right? If you're reading something at the same time as someone who is writing into that tuple, let's say, that comes with some risk. Higher isolation levels prevent you from doing such things. They're safer, but the resources that are required for all of this accounting of which process and which transaction does what um, come with uh, overhead and locks. And locks mean blocking. So you can prevent someone from doing something with your own uh, activity on the database if a high isolation level is being used. The default isolation level for Postgres is read committed, uh, which means that basically each query can only see transactions that have committed before it started. And the highest isolation level that you can have in Postgres is serializable, which implements the uh, ISO standard uh, for serializable isolation. And we will discuss that uh, shortly. So the way Postgres implements concurrency and all of these isolation rules is called multi-version concurrency control or MVCC for short. So MVCC, allows you to have high concurrency and high performance without actually needing to explicitly lock all of your data, right? So if you want to change a value, you don't lock the table or the row and say, wait, everyone else stop. I need to change that. 
Uh, instead, you just go ahead and do it, and the isolation level uh, figures it out for you and protects you and the rest of the users from anomalies. So let's uh, also mention here that MVCC means that reading never waits in Postgres because writing doesn't block reading and reading doesn't block processes that are writing to disk. The way MVCC works is every time you write something, every time you update data or insert data uh, or delete data, uh, excuse me, uh, this write, whether it's an update or a delete, it creates a new version of the tuple or just marks the uh, tuple as not used in the table. And we can say that MVCC implements uh, snapshot isolation, which is this tactic. And snapshot isolation means that by keeping track of the timestamps of activities and transaction IDs, you can figure out um, which version of the tuple you should be seeing from your own query. Uh, so transaction snapshots are provided by something which is internally called the transaction manager. And the transaction manager keeps track of all of these transactions and uh, generates snapshots for each one of them, which means that at this moment in time, this is the state of the database for you, for, for your query. So each transaction um, obtains a transaction snapshot, which for it is the current state of the database so that it can read and make changes to the database safely. And the contents of the transaction snapshot are the earliest transaction that is still active, the first transaction ID that is yet unassigned, which means that this will become the next transaction ID once the next transaction starts, and the list of active transactions, the trans so transactions that haven't committed yet. And you can actually, by calling the function PG current snapshot, you can actually get a visual representation of this transaction snapshot, which tells you the transaction identifiers that we just mentioned. Now, uh, let's look at serializability. So Postgres implements a complicated but ingenious system called uh, SSI or serializable snapshot isolation, which gives you the highest level of safety from serialization anomalies such as the ones that we saw. So SSI gives you the performance of MVCC, but with the safety of the serializable isolation level. So what does SSI do? It checks the, let's say, dependency graph of all these transactions that are coming into the server, and it checks for what we call anti-dependency cycles. So it checks if you're trying to change something that you're reading or uh, if something is read that is changing at the same time. And this, as we saw, can lead to anomalies. So SSI just forbids serialization anomalies. It checks the dependency cycle of every um, of every transaction depending on what data it's accessing and makes a decision whether to allow it or forbid it. So what you get with SSI is, and the serializable isolation level in Postgres is an error instead of a hazardous operation. So instead of letting you go ahead and perform activities simultaneously that may lead to a serialization anomaly, you just get an error and it says your transaction is aborted. So this, counterintuitively can lead to extremely high performance gains if your application uh, is actually designed for that. So you do get reduced concurrency in the sense that things can remain locked and protected from serialization anomalies, but the upside is that you get an instant error when you try to perform one of these actions, which means that you can instantly retry. So. You don't get explicit blocking and you don't get explicit locks. What you get instead are 
uh, what are called SI read locks and read write conflicts. So the read locks uh, apply to the data that you uh, that is being read by various transactions, and the read write conflicts are generated whenever something else is trying to do a write operation with this data set. So simply speaking, instead of just having an application that locks something, performs some activity on this data that it's locked, and then releases it for everyone else to be uh, able to use it, you just get an application side error from the, the session that is not able to uh, access the data at the same time, which means that you can immediately retry this operation. So by getting an application side error, you don't have to wait at all. You're getting an immediate error and you retry instead of waiting and blocking for the other sessions to do whatever they are doing with the data before releasing it. So for some application types, that is the best performance choice that you can get because you want to be sending things to the database all the time. If something fails, retry it. If it fails again, retry it again. Uh, instead of waiting for anything. Your application doesn't have to wait. So we spoke about locks. Let's uh, see how locks are implemented in Postgres. So for the purposes of this talk, we will not focus on explicit locking. So explicit locking is the traditional thing that is understood when you say lock. So these are called heavyweight locks in Postgres, and they're not what we're talking about here. So heavyweight locks are table level locks or row level locks. So you can have a share lock for a table. For example, when you're creating an index on the table, that's what uh, the index operation takes. Or you can have row level such as for update. If you select something for update, it locks the row. So the way explicit locks work is they block other uh, operations that try to acquire conflicting lock modes. So uh, let's say access exclusive is a lock mode that conflicts with row exclusive. So an operation that has obtained an access exclusive lock will cause all other operations that are trying to uh, obtain a row exclusive lock on that row to fail. And you can think of this simply as something which is performing an operation that needs to apply to the whole table. Uh, if it locks the entire table, then uh, uh, updates and deletes cannot happen at the same time. So these types of locks, heavyweight locks, they block read and write access totally, and this makes your application wait uh, when it encounters them. So if you have a performance, if, if you have an application that is uh, really high performance, uh, that can be disastrous for your performance because you can have sessions blocking indefinitely, waiting for someone to release, waiting for some other activity to release a lock on the data that they need to access. So unless your application is very well crafted, um, you are going to have weights when you use explicit locks. And in most cases, your application doesn't take that into account. Now, having said all of this about um, explicit locks and heavyweight locks, let's look at something more interesting in the context of high concurrency, which is lightweight locks. So LW locks and Postgres are what other databases refer to as latches. So what they do is they work automatically. They're not explicit. You don't have to request them explicitly, but they're there. And what they do is uh, they protect the data that's in the shared memory of the database server. Do you remember we said that Postgres is a multi-process uh, thing that uses uh, shared memory? So the way this memory is protected from uh, operations by other processes that are trying to access it or change it at the same time are lightweight locks. They ensure the consistency of your reads and writes and they come in two flavors. You can have shared lightweight locks, uh, shared mode lightweight locks that protect, uh, that are used for reads, and exclusive locks um, that are actually used for writing. 
So lightweight locks are what permits us to have fast MVCC because uh, they automatically protect the data that needs to be protected in this complicated uh, system that we described. Generally, they don't last very long. They're only held very briefly by the system. And, but sometimes lightweight locks protect input-output operations. So this means that that may take longer. Um, so they do keep your data safe, but they can delay you if you have too many uh, sessions trying to access the same data. So this is what we call high concurrency. And the problem is when you have a lightweight lock, if it becomes heavily contended, then this means that you have lots of lockers, lots of transactions and sessions attempting to obtain this lightweight lock. And because they're competing for access to this resource, uh, they end up slowing each other down. This means that your throughput is reduced from your viewpoint, TPS drops. And the worst thing about lightweight locks uh, probably is that they're not really fair. So the way they're implemented, there is no queuing, which means that there are no guarantees that if you're waiting to obtain a lightweight lock on something, then you will, and, and you came in first, that you will be the first one to be served. So more or less, uh, lightweight locks are given and released uh, in a random fashion. So um, high lightweight lock contention may indicate for your database in your application that you have some hot data. Da so data that everyone is trying to access at the same time, like reading from the same table, reading from the same subset of rows, etc. So the way you monitor uh, lightweight locks in Postgres is uh, PG stat activity. Um, if you select the view PG stat activity and you uh, look for the uh, weight event type that is called LW lock, uh, then that's a lightweight lock weight. And the weight event is actually going to tell you which one of the lightweight locks uh, your process is waiting for. Let's discuss something different now. Let's look at snapshot contention. So you remember we said that every session and every transaction obtains a snapshot of the database uh, so as to know who else is messing with their data. So snapshot contention, when you have too many snapshots of the system held by too many transactions, uh, can lead to waiting for connections that are idle. So if you configure your database server to have an extremely high max connections setting, let's say you allow 10,000 connections, uh, then this means that you can have 10,000 transactions at the same time. And this means that they have to obtain uh, 10,000 snapshots and all of this accounting to see which transaction can see which other transactions and if they have committed or not can lead to delays. So if you have too many idle open connections, uh, this means that you will have many snapshots and potentially this can hurt your performance. Uh, so in some cases, it can even uh, reduce your TPS or transactions per second uh, to uh, half what it should be. Just because you have left connections open uh, that are uh, using snapshots. So you can do this. Uh, even with a simple read-only workload, it doesn't need to be heavy writing into the database. Fortunately, in Postgres 14, uh, which is the latest release at this time, um, there is there work has been done to uh, alleviate this, prob this problem partially. So we now have snapshot caching. There's a transaction completion number that invalidates uh, your uh, snapshots that cannot possibly be true. So if this many transactions have elapsed, then this means that uh, your snapshot will definitely not be able to see them. So uh, if you remember the list of transactions that are active, um, uh, this simplifies accounting and can actually improve TPS in this scenario. However, this isn't the only problem that you have. 
uh, when you have many connections. So um, I did a simple test with uh, Postgres 13 um, on an R5 8x large uh, uh, ECS box uh, on Amazon, and I ran PG Bench um, with a uh, number of clients. And by varying the number of clients, I saw the difference in performance uh, over two minutes for a simple update operation uh, on the test database. So with 100 connections, um, I got on this system uh, 1,560 uh, transactions per second with a latency average of 52 milliseconds. With 300 connections, three times as many, I saw a reduction in TPS, but a very large increase in latency for those uh, connections. So the latency average jumped up from 52 to 190 milliseconds. With 1,000 connections, and again, I did not change the Postgres settings on the system, I just varied the number of connections, no other change in the workload or the configuration, TPS dropped yet again, and latency jumped up to 668 milliseconds. So you can see that there's a pretty big impact on uh, having many connections at the same time uh, coming into the database. So besides concurrency, you can overload your system through other ways that may appear normal to you and your application developers, but can cause a problem in Postgres. So um, one of them is having an extremely high transaction rate. In order to understand why this is a problem, um, we need to talk about transactions and their accounting. So transactions are assigned an identifier or transaction ID or TXID. So each transaction gets one of these identifiers, which is an unsigned 32-bit integer. And this field allows us to have this range allows us to have 4.2 billion values, uh, so 4.2 billion separate transaction identifiers. The way you don't run out of transaction identifiers is that this space is circular and has a visibility horizon. What does that mean? So this means that if you are currently in transaction 10,000 for you and your transaction, uh, transaction 9,999 is in the past for you. So that means that it is visible to you because you can see the results of that transaction. For you, transaction 10,001 that may have begun and may be active, for you that is the future. It is invisible to your transaction uh, because uh, it hasn't committed yet for you. So you can see from this that because it is a circular visibility uh, uh, space, you can see 2.1 billion transactions into the past and 2.1 billion transactions uh, still exist in your future. So that is how the MVCC mechanism is uh, implemented in Postgres. What you do is you just keep writing into the heap or into the uh, main body of the table each tuple or row that gets written to the table uh, obtains an X min and an X max, which means the transactions that uh, last modified them. And that is kept inside each, one's, each one of the rows. When you, uh, so this gives you very good write performance because you never stop to delete data and overwrite it. You just keep writing to the table. And additionally, this gives you excellent rollback performance because you don't need to undo anything. Whatever you just wrote into the table, if you abort the transaction or you roll it back, um, it just stays there and is ignored. But this means that this requires maintenance operations because things can get left behind and you need to clean them up afterwards. So if you have a very high transaction burn rate, you can achieve that with Postgres, definitely. It's a high-performance database. Uh, 
But just because you can doesn't mean that you should burn through billions of transactions. Um, so very heavy OLTP type workloads can go through billions of transactions in a short time. Um, so possibly you can run through 2.1 billion transactions in real world systems that I've seen maybe in a week or even less if they're extremely loaded systems. So the problem that you encounter um, when you have very high transaction rates is called transaction ID wraparound. And this means that you are trying to read a very old tuple that is more than 2.1 billion transaction IDs in the past. How can this happen? Because for you, that is the future. Remember, you have a visibility horizon and uh, if you try to read one of the old uh, transaction ID numbers that we mentioned, uh, and if you believe that this is something you should be able to see, the system prevents you from seeing it because that can be in the future uh, in your timeline. So the way Postgres deals with this problem is called freezing. And if you definitely know that something is in the past, like a very old transaction that is 2.1 billion transactions in the past, uh, then what Postgres does is it changes the X min uh, of this tuple to the frozen transaction ID two, which is reserved and is known to always be in the past. So that way um, you can be certain that you're not uh, accessing the future. You're, you're actually looking at a row that was written in the past. This freeze operation that Postgres performs, you need to make sure that it happens before transaction ID wraparound. Otherwise, if you have exhausted the transaction ID space, you wrap around to the beginning and you start reading from the beginning again, uh, you will start seeing things that are in the future. So you need to make sure that this uh, change of X min in every row that's in the past uh, happens before the transaction ID wraparound. Additionally, uh, having very high transaction rates can lead to bloated tables because the way Postgres cleans up after itself uh, is called vacuum. We will talk about that in the next slide. But vacuum has limitations. And one of the limitations is it doesn't lock the table and stop everything else so it can pick up after itself. So if you outrun the maintenance operation called vacuum, then you can end up with bloat in your tables because they keep growing and growing because you keep adding rows that are never getting removed and this can make them uh, balloon in size. So that's what we call bloat, when you have things left over in your table that you no longer need. And something else to keep in mind is that even if transactions are not successful, if they're rolled back or aborted because of an error, the transaction ID is still used. So the aborted transaction ID still remain. So let's look at vacuum and auto vacuum. That's the MVCC maintenance operation that we mentioned. What it does is it removes dead tuples, tuples that are no longer useful because they have been overwritten and there is no transaction that needs to access them anymore. And also it runs the freeze operation on your behalf. So it makes sure that there are uh, it prevents uh, effectively uh, transaction ID wraparound. It also does other things um, that are not relevant to this discussion right now, uh, like uh, maintain your indexes uh, and clean up the uh, transaction logs and so forth. But what's important to keep in mind is that vacuum has overhead and also auto vacuum, which is the automatic operation that makes sure that vacuum happens in the Postgres server that comes with overhead as well because it needs to scan tables and it needs to scan indexes. And it also needs to obtain locks on these tables and those indexes. And it also, um, well, it voluntarily gives up, uh, auto vacuum at least, voluntarily gives up uh, locks on tables and indexes if someone else needs to use them. It's very polite that way. Uh, 
but that means that it also has to wait to obtain locks. So you always have to keep in mind that vacuum is a database operation that needs to happen. And it's the same as every other operation. It needs to access data uh, in this highly concurrent environment. What you also have to keep in mind is that uh, auto vacuum and vacuum have limited capacity by default. So they're not very powerful because uh, there is no need to. You can have systems that are mostly idle and the default configuration for Postgres is to assume that it is a fairly inactive system. Uh, so if you have a really busy system with high workloads and high concurrency, then you will need to uh, examine your auto vacuum settings. So now let's look at all of these things that we mentioned, how do we deal with them? So lock contention. Um, when you have explicit locks in your application, which I believe you shouldn't, uh, because they can lead to weights, um, you just try to avoid that. You don't use explicit locks in your application, and that way nobody has to wait for someone else to finish what they're doing. Um, that's the whole point of a concurrent system. So you can use uh, SSI, or the serializable isolation level, and just keep retrying if what you're trying to write to uh, is uh, in use by someone else, and that way everyone is safe and your application can just retry it instead of waiting indefinitely for someone else to give up a lock on another resource. For this, you need to make your application tolerant. You need to allow it to retry operations to the database. Lightweight lock contention is when you have, plainly speaking, too many connections coming into your server. So uh, this high concurrency can lead to uh, lightweight lock contention and a reduction in performance. So what you can do is you can insert a connection pooler between your application and the database, and the connection pooler makes sure that uh, not too many connections make it into the database if they don't need to. So, for example, um, if you have activities that open a connection to the database and then wait for another day until they do the next thing, uh, then connection pooling can help with that. It can help with idle connections, and it can also help uh, with throttling uh, how many connections make it into the database in a polite manner. Because if you set max connections to 10 to ensure that only 10 connections can make it into your database, everyone else is going to get an error. If you have a connection pooler, then a connection pooler can actually make them wait and queue uh, to obtain a connection to the database instead. So. This sounds counterintuitive, right? You're asking me to put something in my database, in front of my database, that will actually make it slower for everyone. Well, not really, and we will see exactly why. Um, one connection pooling solution that you can use uh, is PG Bouncer. That's a pretty good solution. It's decent. Uh, so, in effect, what you will be doing is you will be throttling your application by reducing the number of connections that are reaching the server. So you set the PG Bouncer setting max client connection to whatever your application believes it needs. Like uh, if it believes that it needs a thousand connections, you leave max client connection to a thousand, but you only allow through max DB connections. So you set max DB connections to 100. And for these 1000 competing connections coming in from the application, then only 100 make it through to the database at the same time. So what you're effectively doing is you are introducing latency on the application side in order to save your server performance. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're slowing down your application, right? Because if you do this, your queries that are no longer competing with everyone else for resources may actually execute faster. So you may be able to get through more work uh, on the database side rather than less by reducing the number of connections. So uh, PG Bouncer has various connection modes. Um, the default uh, is not useful in this scenario, uh, which is session mode because it behaves uh, pretty much uh, 
like uh, how Postgres behaves by default uh, for high contention scenarios. So for high concurrency scenarios, excuse me. So it has a mode called transaction mode in which PG Bouncer just reuses connections uh, for the same user when the transaction ends. So it doesn't need to open a new one. It just reuses one of the existing connections that are already open. Uh, also, there is statement pool mode in PG Bouncer where it reuses the connection for actually the next statement, not even the next transaction. So you don't have transactional control here uh, and it is effectively the same as being in auto commit mode all the time. So if your application already does that, if your application assumes that every time it talks to the database, it's in an auto commit scenario, then you can very well use uh, statement mode and that's gonna be very economical. So in a real world use case uh, where I saw a PG Bouncer with a misbehaving application that was trying to parallelize too many jobs and was actually misbehaving because it was leaving all of those job connections open uh, even when the job's finished, uh, max connections was set to 5,000 with uh, 2,500 and more connections open at the same time. After we put PG Bouncer in front of the database, then we actually noticed that only about 30 jobs were actually getting executed at each moment in time. So we saw that Postgres only had 30 connections open uh, in uh, PG activity. And the end result, as we said, is that because they were no longer competing for snapshots and resources and lightweight locks, the queries did actually execute much faster. Other solutions that you can use besides PG Bouncer are uh, you can have application side uh, connection pooling. Um, there are a multitude of solutions, uh, for, for example, for Java that provide um, application side queuing. It's not optimal because uh, you get uh, longer uh, latency times uh, when everything has to happen at the application side and it's generally preferable to have it closer to the server. Uh, but you can also use other solutions that are on the server side, such as pgpool2 and Odyssey. Another significant thing you can do to mitigate this situation where you have too much work coming into your database is splitting your workload. So with streaming and logical replication, you can adapt your application to have read-only and write connections. So you can send your write workload to the primary server, and you can have standby servers receiving uh, the read operations from your application. And this can lead up to horizontal read scalability. So if you're doing many read operations, uh, you can just keep adding standby servers and you distribute the load among those standby servers. Uh, the way you can do it very easily is you can set up a read-only endpoint and read-write endpoint uh, in PG Bouncer, and that way you can send operations that you know are just reads from the application to the read-only endpoint and writes to the primary server. Um, you can also split your database and logically replicate a subset of the data, uh, for example, for analytics uh, and heavy analytics jobs on a separate server that is a logical replica and can have your entire data set or parts of your data set that you're interested in analyzing. For transaction ID wraparound, what you can do is you can batch your operations. So just imagine by batching a thousand writes together in, in one transaction, that means that you will go through uh, a thousand times fewer transactions than you would without batching. So this can also, uh, but you, you can also mitigate a transaction ID wraparound by increasing the effectiveness of auto vacuum. Um, by tweaking its knobs, and this means that you can have more efficient freeze. Speaking of auto vacuum, uh, it makes it uh, the key idea is you make it work harder so you can avoid these problems that we mentioned. And when you make auto vacuum work harder, people notice that it takes IO and CPU, and it's reasonable that they get concerned about overhead. But the alternative is worse because. You cannot avoid vacuum in Postgres yet. That's the uh, state of things. So if you can end up outrunning your auto vacuum, uh, 
and introducing bloat that uh, balloons your table size. And because vacuum doesn't actually reclaim space from the operating system or your file system, this means that in order to get rid of the space that the dead rows uh, that vacuum cleaned that are still allocated to that table uh, and are taking up space on disk, then you will need to vacuum full. So it's better to have a very effective auto vacuum that doesn't let your table size grow uh, with bloat rather than the alternative. And vacuum full is bad because it needs to lock the table and rewrite it from the beginning. So the way you increase auto vacuum potency is you can increase the amount of memory that it uses. Uh, one gigabyte is a good amount of maintenance work mem. And you can also uh, have a number of auto vacuum workers working in parallel uh, vacuuming different tables. Also, you can tweak the cost delay and cost limit parameters uh, that let auto vacuum uh, perform better and uh, go through much more data in the same period of time. So monitoring tools that you can use to detect all of these situations and analyze your weight events and see what your database is uh, waiting on, well, you can use uh, PSQL. Uh, all of these uh, functions and views uh, that can be used for monitoring can be accessed from a simple client such as PSQL. You can also get indication of whether something is wrong with your database by using traditional Unix tools such as PS, TOP, IOSTAT, and VMSTAT to see uh, why your system is busy and where this uh, load is coming from. PG Admin also offers monitoring for your uh, databases. There are standalone solutions that you can use like PG View, PG Stats, PG Metrics. There are also uh, checkers that you can integrate with another monitoring solution like Nagios or uh, any other monitoring solution that you have like Check Postgres and Check PG Activity. And then there are proprietary solutions that can offer monitoring. Uh, one example is EDB's uh, Postgres Enterprise Manager. So my disclaimer is every workload is different. Uh, so you can try to optimize for uh, uh, the wrong workload. So don't do premature optimization, know your workload. And uh, for example, OLTP workloads tend to be read-write with shorter queries, generally speaking, right? Uh, they do have high contention because um, everyone is accessing the same tables. They tend to have a very sustained rate and fewer idle connections uh, because ideally the application should connect to the database, do whatever it does and disconnect. Web server workloads, on the other hand, tend to have a read bias uh, rather than a write bias. Uh, they can be shorter queries with less contention, but you may have the web applications leaving many idle connections until the next time they reuse them. And this is where connection pooling can help. Uh, Spark jobs, batch jobs, and analytics uh, tend to have, uh, generally speaking, a read-write workload with longer queries and uh, higher contention, but they can also, as we saw, leave behind idle connections from jobs that have terminated. Um, but again, every workload is different. So to conclude, uh, you need to know your workload, you need to study your application's behavior before you start tuning your server, you need to monitor for signs of high contention, uh, if you're over overloading your server, you don't want your users to complain first. You need to know it immediately that something is slowing it down. So we saw that Postgres can deal with a very high workload and a very high transaction rate as long as you don't overwhelm it. So knowing its limits and knowing what your application does is key for that. You need to keep in mind that you don't have to be married to just one server or one server and its standby, you can split your workload and you can make your application split its workload. And finally, uh, do use connection pooling, do use auto vacuum because the defaults are very conservative. So thank you very much for sitting through this talk. Your reward for sitting through all of this is this picture of uh, Holyrood Park from, uh, uh, it's actually in Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, where I live.
And thanks again for attending. And you can also find me on Twitter. I'm at virus. Cheers. Yeah, if you if you get more about how posters work and looking at this presentation, I think it's the right way to to start with that very video. So thank you very much for that presentation. It was really good. And then I start with one of the last questions that they ask about OLTP. So if you can give uh, an example of a use case, because you give a description of the slide, but what is a good case example of uh, OLTP and OLAP, maybe, which is kind of the... Right. So uh, OLTP means uh, online transaction processing. A good example is like uh, if you have um, something like a point of sales uh, that is recording a sale and it's sending it to the uh, central database, uh, that's a row. And whenever someone makes a purchase, that adds a new row to the database. And this means that you have a database that's receiving lots of rows uh, of the same type, like a uh, purchase transaction. Um, and generally, OLTP loads have uh, specific uh, operations that you do with them, like uh, you need to count uh, how many transactions happened and so forth. Uh, so they tend not to have very complicated analytics. Uh, OLAP, on the other hand, online uh, analytics processing, uh, is when you have things such as data cubes, and you need to analyze the data multidimensionally, uh, not like simple rows that record the sale. And those generally tend to have longer queries, uh, more complicated, and less batch processing, uh, because you generally tend to run those analytics jobs maybe once a day. Right, okay. Good, thanks. So next question is more related than back to OLTP. Uh, there is a question from Georgios, whether a uh, tuple that is committed, does it get immediately available in the index or not? Yes and no. <laughs> so whenever you commit something, um, that means that yes, it becomes immediately available in the index for the transactions that can actually access this information. So if you remember, we said that some transactions are invisible to your own transaction because your transaction began uh, before they did. So even if the transaction uh, has committed in the meantime, it will not be visible to your session uh, because of MVCC rules. Uh, but uh, as to whether the index gets updated at the same time as the table, yes, it absolutely does. Whenever you commit, uh, the indexes are updated uh, immediately. Um, there are a few exceptions to specific index types that are not B-tree. So um, I think the uh, GIN index type has some processing that takes place. Um, the index does receive your update, but it's not finalized. And there's a queue of operations that needs to take place uh, after the commit. Things that you you think that you really have to pay attention, like this is a really a red alarm that you have to be worrying about your system because some of the things that you monitor are constantly changing. But there might be something that you say like this is very very important. Sorry, I missed the beginning of your question because uh, yeah, you were all you disappeared. So about monitoring index blot and, mm -hmm. and 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 table blot because you were talking about the visibility of sure. the index, the visibility of the of the row. So what are the things that are, when you're monitoring that you really have to pay more attention than other stuff? Because I mean, what are the th things that have to trigger an alarm or take an action automatically? Well, um, uh, I think someone's pasted in the chat. If you Google uh, monitoring and measuring bloat in Postgres, you'll get lots of scripts that do that. And many, and you probably don't even have to run them yourself. Um, most of the monitoring solutions that I'm aware of already have 
monitoring for bloat. Now, uh, the problem with bloat is you need to actively monitor in order to run vacuums on the tables that are in danger of becoming bloated. Uh, because if you don't act fast enough, the size of the tables and indexes can grow to a point that will actually cause problems such as disk space exhaustion on your uh, system. So it's better to be proactive, better to have very active auto vacuum settings uh, and alarms, as you said, to figure out what's happening with the table. Because if the, if the sizes of the data files uh, um, become too big, then what you have to do to reclaim this space is lock the table totally. And that is unacceptable in a production environment. Right. Talking about locking the table totally, you said that vacuum doesn't block the table, doesn't lock the table. What about vacuum? vacuum? Yeah, vacuum does use locks, but it gives them up voluntarily uh, whenever some other operation needs to take place. Vacuum full uh, takes an exclusive lock on the table and blocks everything else. So the table is unusable for the duration of vacuum full. What it's doing is it's rewriting the entirety of the table and the indexes from the beginning. Right, so it's not really vacuuming, it's rebuilding the table. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so getting back to, to the vacuum part and the maintenance, so there is a question about the freeze. So you were discussing about how freeze work and about this X min value. And Nick uh, is asking whether freeze is now a flag in the in the tables now or the block and pages. Can you look Correct. Yeah, yeah. so my, uh, my simplification of uh, the um, transaction wraparound problem uh, means that I didn't uh, give you the latest information. Uh, so yes, uh, the uh, frozen flag is now uh, stored in the header uh, for the row, but uh, it's still an operation that needs to take place. So effectively nothing has changed. The only change is that instead of overwriting the old X-Min with uh, uh, the number two, uh, we can keep the old X-Min like for examining the order of transactions and for forensic purposes and so on. Um, but what doesn't change is that something still has to scan through the table uh, to determine whether the rows need to be frozen and actually apply the frozen flag. Great, thanks. Okay, good, very good explanations. Again, great talk, Jimmy. I think if you want wants to know more about how it really works internal, this is one of the talks that uh, one should, should be looking at. And also slowing things uh, down with, with a PG bouncer or a pulling, uh, to pulling tool in front of it. Very good tip. It seems to be counterintuitive, but at the end you can see the results. So it, do, it does seem counterintuitive, but we've seen it in the field. Uh, people have tried reducing what they're asking from their database and that actually made it work faster. Great. Thank you. Okay. Jimmy, see you next time. Cheers. Bye.